Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here uh, in this Egypt Investment uh, Summit. I'm very delighted uh, to be here and moderate this panel. This is my first ever moderation, and I'm uh, very delighted uh, to be moderating uh, a panel for my motherland, Egypt. So I'll be uh, very, very biased, to be honest. And I uh, would like to invite our esteemed uh, panelists uh, to up to the stage. Please welcome Mr. Todd Wilcox, and he is the CEO of HSBC Egypt. And he is the Senior Director uh, of Investments for uh, Value. And also Mr. Sharif Abdelal, and he is the Regional M&A Head and the Country Manager for Egypt for Camco Invest. Also, please welcome Mr. <laughs> Serafi. <laughs> and he's the CEO of uh, Lift Sex Labs, Egypt. Thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, Egypt, uh, during the last period and the last uh, years, it was a very painful and tough, tough uh, moment uh, faced Egypt. Maybe, it's, maybe it was one of the uh, toughest uh, economic uh, crises that Egypt been through. But thankfully, uh, Egypt now uh, succeeded to, uh, to get out of the bottleneck and everything changed, turn around. There is a dramatic change in the sentiment for the international investors and the uh, international institutions. So uh, I think uh, now is the moment to look at Egypt, to invest. Uh, the government has uh, been uh, doing so much to restore confidence in the economy during the last uh, period. And we have seen this mind-blowing FDI deals that never heard of $35 billion worth of cash been injected in the economy for Ras al Hikmah deal. I guess most of you heard about it. So uh, Egypt, if you, uh, I think, if you look at the map of, uh, of the world, I think each one of you, if you'd like to buy a property, if you go to any developer or you want to go to, to buy a house in any project, new development, you, I think you guys need to look at the, the layout and the master plan of the project and try to uh, select the best ever location in, uh, in the project in order to, to get the best out of it. I think Egypt, if you look at the world map, you couldn't get any better location in the world. It's just in the right, in the center. It's purely gifted and blessed with the location in the heart of the world. You have the uh, Red Sea on the right. You have the, uh, the Mediterranean on the north, you have the River Nile, it has it all. You have the most cheapest labors, I think, uh, labor cost in the, in, in the whole world. So I think Egypt has the whole thing to go, uh, to go forward and be a financial hub, a logistics hub. So uh, you have the sun, 36, <laughs> five days everywhere. You have the demographics of the people. I think I took a fresh number from Yara. She said 117 million people now. That was a couple of days ago. I think maybe it's 120 now. <laughs> well, we are very productive. <laughs> so yes, I think Egypt is the, uh, has it all. So I will start with Todd. And you are Todd, you are leading the, uh, the biggest private bank in Egypt. And you, I think if I still recall you, you moved to Egypt uh, maybe in June 2020 during the pandemic, which was very tough, very tough time moving from different locations to... Yeah, I, I moved from China though, so it was... <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it's, all, it's all relative, yes. right? So I think what were the steps... Better move, huh? Yeah, I moved <laughs> just in time. Right? <laughs> just Perfect in time. timing. <laughs> so I think uh, if I may ask you, what were the steps or policies the government took that have positively influenced investment attractiveness and one, uh, what additional steps needed? Mm. 
Certainly, I, you mentioned the, the Ras al-Hekma deal. That, that deal actually unlocked uh, and, um, a lot of cash and, uh, and gave relief because we were, um, Egypt was very much struggling with foreign currency, right? That it, it, uh, there, there was a considerable backlog, you know, up, up over um, uh, 200 million, or sorry, what was it? Sorry, 2 billion um, in, in demand. And that, that um, Rasa Hekma deal injected a lot of liquidity into the market. And I think the confidence has is, is started to come back. Uh, so the, the one thing is the transaction with the IMF, I thought, um, and the transparency of that transaction. So the, the IMF had some real requirements that the government has been fulfilling. One is first and foremost to tackle inflation. So we saw an 800 basis point increase in interest rates and a, a real clamp down. Um, government spending needed to reduce by 15%. And that was the entire government spending, not just the spending the Minister of Finance had side of, because there was a number of near government entities that also ran their own budgets. And, and we haven't seen the transparency in that yet, but I assume we will at the end of this year when the IMF does its uh, year-end review. Uh, the other is the pound floating. And this has been a, a real um, point of contention for some years. And the, the pound was, um, you know, we, we were constantly seeing a devaluation followed by parallel market price. And the, the last um, piece was a full float. And the pound is floating um, between 48 and 50 right now to the US dollar. Uh, that was a big step forward uh, because companies and investors can understand foreign currency fluctuation they can't absorb lack of liquidity. They need to be able to get their money out. So those were all the policies that I thought really um, took, a step, took us a step forward and, and released. And it took a while for confidence to come back, but we're seeing it. It's the confidence of the Egyptian people to start taking, because uh, my belief is there was no shortage of foreign currency out there. It just wasn't in the banking sector, and it started to come back. So we've seen remittances. Um, in the second quarter, we're 7.5 billion US, up about 60%. We're seeing it come back. And remittances are the largest source of foreign currency in Egypt, uh, exceeds Suez and tourism combined. Tourism is also up, though. It's about 6% over the pre-pandemic highs. Uh, we're seeing that come down. Suez is down about 60% because of the situation in the Red Sea. But I, I think free float and a real focus on getting money into the banking sector has, uh, has is increasing confidence. Excellent. So Yara, uh, what role do you, uh, NBFI is playing in Egypt economy moving forward? Um, the NBFI sector overall has been gaining a lot of importance, I feel, over the past period. It's been witnessing a lot of growth, whether it's the MSME sector. I think um, the latest figures were as of July, volumes grew by around 50%. Number of beneficiaries has grown by 170%, which is great. Uh, whether it's mortgage, which has also more than doubled over the same period, for based, um, sorry, compared to the same period last year. Um, the same for factoring and leasing. Um, we're seeing a lot of significant growth there. And uh, consumer lending, which is the space in which value operates, has been growing tremendously over the past few years. Um, as value itself, we've already surpassed both volumes, number of transactions, and number of customers um, for the full year of last year. And that's while maintaining still a very um, healthy portfolio with very healthy risk metrics. Um, and I think that the growth of the sector has been driven by a number of things. You mentioned the size of Egypt's market is unquestionable, but also it's the demographics and dynamics within that. Um, we're seeing um, a massively expanding middle class that are driving a lot of consumer demand. I think the figures were supposed to be doubling by next year compared to 2021 figures. And when you think of 50% middle class out of 115 or 17 million people, that's massive. And they're young and they're tech savvy and they're helping drive also the digital transformation. Um, that's being heavily supported by the government and policy as well. Um, <clears throat> we're also seeing a lot of support from the regulators in creating um, better oversight, more clarity, trying to streamline processes, um, trying to improve policies by issuing new regulations like the FinTech law, for instance, which is helping companies that are operating in that space be all operating under one unified framework, and that in itself increases investor confidence, 
it helps create jobs. Um, yeah, so I think those would be the three main drivers. The regulatory framework that's improving, uh, the size of the market and the market dynamics, and the digital transformation that we're uh, witnessing. Excellent. For you, Sharif, uh, if you tell me that how Egypt's recent currency devaluation and adoption of or more flexible exchange rate impacted the investment environment in Egypt, especially you are leading one of the uh, GCC uh, companies in Egypt? Okay, sure. Um, uh, the valuation, of course, um, had led to a great uncertainty in uh, the market for the last, like, um, at least three years uh, over the aggressive movements of the currency and uh, lack of clarity and unexpected uh, rates uh, that should be availing. Uh, this uh, creating a kind of a gap between the investors and the um, potential uh, targets for those uh, investments. And this gap were widening over uh, Time. However, there was, we can say, the uh, great appetite, uh, but the gap uh, widening, and you can't close it due to uncertainties. So this led to a uh, slow uh, down and uh, pricing difficulties between ask and uh, demand to have uh, transactions on the M and A side. And even on the operational side for the uh, companies uh, in uh, Egypt itself, there were uh, the, the currency itself made a disruption for uh, them. They couldn't uh, get the proper raw materials required. They couldn't uh, do the required capex for expansions and uh, machinery. They couldn't even price uh, the end products for the users. Um, hence, a lot of transactions or investments in the pipeline were postponed or uh, cancelled till, till clarity. That, having said that, uh, it pushed the government uh, from the other side to do a great, uh, major reforms uh, for the investment uh, sector and the currency and to enhance the climate for investors. So we have witnessed um, more clarity on the um, FX after the flotation which happened several uh, times um, and the kind of stability in the FX uh, market. Uh, the, the gap between the black market or the parallel market and the official market uh, narrowed down and almost it went to um, zero. Um, and it became a better investor's landscape. We have seen after such a good appetite from the GCC investors um, to Egypt, especially driven by UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia and others um, in strategic um, investments and in infrastructure or more into the real estate uh, side. Um, that helped to boost the reserves of the country at uh, that time. So uh, the impact of the devaluation is a mixed bag. It's on the short term, of course, it's tough, challenging and uh, negative. And on the long term, it's beneficial for the country, for the manufacturing side, for the production and for the growth. Excellent, thank you. For you, Ram, is, uh, would you please just put some color on how the startup ecosystem has evolved in Egypt over the last 10 years and what are the best lessons you've been learned? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> just a little bit about background, maybe about uh, Flat6 Labs and what we do and where we are today as Egypt when it comes to investments in startups or early stage companies. Uh, Flat6 Labs started exactly 13 years ago. Tomorrow is our 13th anniversary oh. for launching Flat6 Labs. So we're very proud of <laughs> like 13th year, you know, it's like we're still uh, not decide about how we're celebrating this, but uh, it's, it's uh, been uh, a long journey for sure for Flatix Labs in Egypt and across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, we were created mainly to cater for a very specific gap in the market where 
especially after the Arab Spring and the Egyptian Re Revolution in 2011, um, we found a lot of youth and young people who have amazing ideas and a lot of passion to start their businesses, but they lack the support and the funding in the market. In a structured way, in a very, um, I would say, systematic way to um, be able to get this funding and receive it and also grow their businesses. So Flasix Labs was created by the same founders of Sawari Ventures, which is a late uh, stage uh, VC fund, venture capital fund in Egypt to basically s serve this gap in the market. Uh, and it started as an accelerator program where we mix the support uh, we give to the entrepreneurs with the funding. Um, it was very small tickets that we invested in startups back then, ranging from 10 to $20,000, which is, of course, sounds very tiny now, but that was, again, 13 years ago. <laughs> um, and the model has evolved over the years, as well as the Egyptian startup ecosystem. Egypt sits in a very interesting nexus of being one of the big three and one of the big four. The big three are the three biggest ecosystems uh, or markets in the Middle East and North Africa, which are Saudi, UAE, and Egypt. And the big four being in, in Africa, uh, it's South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria, and uh, Kenya, where most, like almost 80% of the VC funding uh, in Africa or the Middle East actually goes uh, to these like two groups. Um, so that also puts Egypt in a very interesting position where we are actually the only overlap between these two markets, right? Um, and I think this has always been like one of the most overlooked uh, facts when it comes to startups trying to think about how they are growing their business. And also for us as investors in Egypt and for many investors in Africa, there has been always a bit, a bit of disconnect between Egypt and the bigger African uh, ecosystem, which we're trying to address now. And I think many players in the African VC space are trying to address as well. The ecosystem has developed a lot answering your question in terms of like what happened over the last 10 years. There has been a lot of reforms from the government uh, side as well as initiative to support startups. Um, there are three main ministries in Egypt that are very active when it comes to the startup and the SME support. So the Ministry of ICT, the Ministry of Planning, uh, and now it's, I think, merged with the Ministry of International Cooperation. And of course, we have a newly formed Ministry of Investment, which also uh, oversees GAFI, which is our General Investment Authority. So these are the main bodies that are concerned with the startups and have put a lot of programs to attract international investors, nurture, uh, startups locally, provide them with the framework where they can start and they can grow. Um, also, we have uh, a very important program that was started by the World Bank uh, and um, locally managed by the micro, small and medium SME authority, uh, MISMIDA, um, which development authority. And this, uh, this uh, work by MISMIDA and the World Bank has actually managed to inject directly $50 million in Egyptian startups over the last four years and generate more than half a million dollars of funding from other parties, uh, mainly DFIs and other financial institutions that invested in Egyptian startups over the last four or five years. Also, if you look at the Egyptian startup ecosystem and how it developed over the last 10 years, I think there are two phases. So we have like up to 2019 and the last five years. And the last five years, I think, were super interesting for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, 2019 definitely has start where we started seeing a really a huge uptick in terms of number of startups and not amount of invested was, I think, 2021, when Egyptian startups managed to raise more than $600 million of funding. That remains to be the highest amount that startups raised in Egypt over the last like 20 or 30 years. There was like a slowdown over the last couple of years, but definitely 2021 was one of the biggest years. Uh, also, we have, in terms of number of startups, in terms of VCs locally and regionally and internationally, seeing and, and investing in the Egyptian market definitely have seen a huge growth uh, when it comes to that. Um, so the funding started actually picking up the number of startups. We have started seeing a lot of like entrepreneurs or people who think they would like to be entrepreneurs and start moving from corporate or more, much more secure jobs to start their businesses. And I've started seeing a lot of great success stories like Value or, or Paynas, and we have also like a lot of successful fintech companies like Paymop, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, Highland, and uh, many others. Definitely fintech is one of the biggest sectors when it comes to where the investments are happening. And I think that's also for a reason, it's one of the most structured, it's very highly linked to um, the work that is done by the central bank and also the banking ecosystem in Egypt. Unlike many other sectors like healthcare and education or logistics or ICT in general, where there, there isn't that much structure or regulation. So anything can go, but also it leaves a lot of room for um, like uncertainty and you know, uh, for startups to be able to navigate all of this. Unlike fintech, it's a very long process for sure. However, 
the central bank and a lot of banks start putting together initiatives to support the fintech movement in Egypt uh, over the last few years. So yeah, I think this is where we are today, and more than happy to go through that uh, further Brilliant. later. Thank you, Ramos. Back to you, Todd. Can you just uh, tell us about your vision for the banking sector and the investment environment in Egypt? And what's your role as one of the biggest private banks in Egypt mm. to bring FDIs? Yeah, I guess, so we, we occupy a bit of a different space than some of the other banks. We bank the, as I was saying, 90% of the multinationals. We've got about 40% wallet share with those multinationals. And uh, because we're a global bank and we've got offices all over the, the world, uh, it's really about introducing our clients that are looking for opportunities in other countries to the opportunities in Egypt. And I can give a, a couple of examples of that. I was in Istanbul uh, earlier this year and, uh, and met with three HSBC Turkey clients, all of whom are looking at coming to Egypt and for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, the cost of a, a worker uh, that you're talking about, Tamar, mm -hmm. um, is 500 US in Turkey. It's 150 US. In, in Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian government has invested uh, a fair bit in infrastructure over the last few years, and that's everything from transportation to ports to energy, right, to make sure that you've got the, the right ingredients to bring operations to, uh, to Egypt. And the free zones, you know, a couple of weeks ago we had uh, the head of Gafi, the um, organization for, for um, bringing FDI in, and the Suez Economic Zone, uh, at an event here in, in the UK, and we had 150 uh, UK clients who are interested in expanding into Egypt. Uh, so I think our role is really to build those bridges between, for instance, uh, HSBC UK and HSBC Egypt, and pull, uh, I guess, pull the clients to see the opportunity uh, that exists there. I think the Egyptian government is doing a good job now of getting the Egyptian story out, uh, and certainly Gafi and Suez. Uh, certainly are. Uh, the new Minister of Investment, uh, Minister of Finance also, uh, really trying to, to increase the profile of Egypt and improve the business, um, it's the ease of doing business in Egypt. Uh, Gafi doing um, their golden visa program for, for corporates. You know, we saw, um, uh, this is public, so I can hire, which is a, a Chinese company manufacturer, uh, be able to get its golden visa to actually manufacturing and export within 12 months, right? So they, they came in, built the plant, and now we're already exporting. Uh, so I think that's really critical. Where Egypt is interested mostly, though, is manufacturing for export, mm -hmm. right? That's the, that's the secret. If you're coming to Egypt in the past, people just wanted to import to Egypt and distribute because you got 110 million at that time, 117 million uh, people who are consuming, and that's not working. Uh, so we have seen, uh, we are seeing an improvement in uh, exports. If you look at Q2, you know, year over year, uh, the, the number of non-oil exports is up 12%. So it's slowly coming. Uh, so I, I think it's the right ingredients. I think we're the right bank for that. Fantastic. So Yara, would you please comment on the collaboration between different stakeholders for financial sectors like banks? Um, and, uh, yes, fintech. sure. And I'd also like to comment on something that Rome said about fintech. Uh, I am always a little bit biased towards fintech, but I think that even though we're seeing most of the capital being diverted there, it is largely because that's where you get the highest return and capital will always flow to where you get the highest return. But what I think we're also going to see a lot of is these spillover effects where these improvements in fintech, be it digital payments or infrastructure, will spill over into other sectors, and these other sectors will also start to boom. So um, digital payments can help expand health tech because now you have better service delivery, or it can help um, digital payments helps e-commerce, and then e-commerce opens up opportunities for logistics, which ends up feeding into agritech, for instance. So I think we're going to see a lot of these spillover effects in Egypt, and the startup ecosystem is booming and is very, very interesting um, and is creating thousands and thousands of jobs uh, every year, which is fantastic. Um, in terms of the different stakeholders within the sector and the relationships between them, I'd say that it's a very symbiotic relationship. It's very positive. Um, growth in all of these sectors has these multiplier effects. So, for instance, you have um, the regulatory bodies that are creating all these conducive policies are helping companies uh, like myself, like ourselves, 
grow and when we grow we have more demand for credit from banks so banks are more keen to give us credit and then the banks also grow their portfolios and we end up offloading to these banks so it's all this very positive cycle of collaboration between all the stakeholders that are really driving the whole uh, sector forwards be it NBFI be it banking be it the regulatory sector or be it our consumers as well thank you yeah Sharif uh, how would you describe the Egyptian investment activity in at the moment, in particular in the MA business? Sure. Um, we can say simply that it's uh, recovering. Um, we can witness a good uh, recovery, especially over the last um, um, two quarters. Um, and that's on the back of a kind of clarity or stability on the FX uh, rates in the banks and the central bank controlling it uh, well, the, the, the flotation. Again, um, we can see a good appetite, as mentioned previously, f starting from the Gulf side. And a lot of investments, as you mentioned, um, Ras al Hekma and others, uh, which we are hearing um, about uh, soon. Um, and uh, we can see that um, we have the programs of the government for privatization, which they are uh, working on hardly to um, give a good confidence for the investors and to increase efficiency in the market. Um, in the same time, we can see that uh, the private equities are uh, coming back uh, and searching for opportunities in the mo local market. Uh, reflecting the confidence in the growth and the currency and the future of the uh, companies. In the same time, we can see that important side is the consolidation. Mm -hmm. After the uh, devaluation and the currency being uh, in another position versus uh, the hard currencies, uh, the consolidation is extremely important and that's the main theme the private equities and other uh, investors are working on now to consolidate and make uh, stronger platforms to create a higher efficiency and uh, synergies to enhance profitability and to face the currency and the devaluation um, so yeah the the future is better and uh, more positive uh, on the side of the mergers and the acquisitions for the local market in uh, Egypt. So from your perspective, what do you think the, the hot picks of the sector? Which, which sector do you recommend for investors? Um, usu currently, uh, of course, uh, over uh, different periods of time, it changes. As we are speaking now, the most important um, sectors or the hot uh, sectors are the ones with um, export-oriented uh, platforms or um, they have the ability to export either full of their uh, products or uh, partially because this hedges very well for the fluctuations in the currency and in previously it was the defensive sectors but now it's not the defensive sectors and again any sector with a huge or massive growth is of an great appetite for investors because that growth will compensate for any uh, expected future devaluation. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Ramiz, what the, the current status of venture capital in Egypt and what are the challenges we need to work on? Um, yeah, we, yeah, we're not short of challenges when it comes to a lot of things in Egypt and definitely and it remains to be true also for venture capital and startups. I think, like, I'll pick up from the last point. I think that's the, almost like the biggest elephant in the room when it comes to um, any investors, local or international, eyeing an Egyptian startup for an investment. Uh, the currency situation, right? Uh, the devaluation and the currency being uh, not so stable over the last few years definitely impacted the ecosystem in a very negative way. Uh, many of the investors, um, most of actually the investors, funnily enough, most of the investors in Egypt who are investing in venture capital, they are investing um, in dollars. So their funds are actually, most of them uh, are funded by DFIs and European or international investors. And subsequently, they are investing and valuing startups in dollar terms. 
Um, so actually, for, from their perspective, they would like to see their returns also happening in dollars. So for them to be able to get these kinds of returns, most probably it has to be a trade of sale that they actually owned an equity, a specific amount of equity in a startup, and then they are selling this later as an acquisition or to another investor. And this investor then has to pay in dollars as well. So try to value an Egyptian startup uh, that is operating in an Egyptian market according to Egyptian standards uh, in dollar terms. It's very, very difficult. And even just setting budgets and um, forecasting for the future, like now a lot of the startups are trying to forecast for 2025 and then they don't know like if, if the exchange rate will change, if that will also impact their valuation. We've started seeing actually down uh, rounds as well, like not up rounds where a lot of startups had to revisit their own valuation um, in, a, in a more like, you know, down, down uh, way than, than upper way. Um, so that's one of the biggest challenges for sure. Um, I know that there is a lot of uh, initiatives to try to hedge this somehow. Um, I don't think there's a very clear path for this, how this can happen other than I think the whole economic stability in Egypt would definitely reflect positively on this. So it's more of like a macro issue than being too specific to startups. But since most, like this is like a sector that is highly linked to international investments and international funding, so it, it would be very difficult not actually to uh, also look into solutions when it comes to this for the startups. Uh, so this is one of the first things that maybe we need to uh, work on in terms of challenges. The second one is definitely the regulatory framework where the startups are operating. So today, for a multi-million dollar company or someone is starting a capital and going to thousand, like would like to set up a bank account at HSBC with a capital of like 10 million dollars or pounds, they will go through the same exact process if they're setting up a startup company with a capital of 100,000 um, pounds. Almost like the same length in terms of the process, the, more, the, the complications. Of course, the government made it much, much easier through GAFI and they tried to eliminate a lot of like the redundancy and, and all these steps as well with the one-stop shops and, and such. However, again, it doesn't really make sense in a lot of like the ecosystems that are trying to support startups or economies in general trying to support startups, not to think of having more of like a startup label or a specific closed environment for startups or smaller companies to operate, and maybe they can graduate from this to larger uh, structures, for example. Tunisia, and if we look at our neighbors in Tunisia, they have uh, the startup label. Uh, which is uh, an initiative that started as like more, almost like a parallel structure to the existing one for corporates, which allows, uh, it, it gives many benefits to startups to be able to uh, hold their uh, foreign investments, for example, in foreign currency, to be able to like hire people and pay them in foreign currency. Uh, a lot of these matters were guided by the startup label and to go through and, and get the startup label, you go and present to a committee and then you get granted the label. I think maybe something similar to this in Egypt could also be a solution. Um, also, um, in terms of capital availability in Egypt, I think it's in most emerging markets, especially in the Middle East and Africa, we need more capital available for startups. Right? Everyone is complaining about that there isn't enough capital or not, there isn't enough depth when it comes to all the stages of funding for like the, the life cycle of funding a startup in Egypt at the seed level up to Series A and beyond. Um, we have seen a lot of work being done by DFIs and international investors supporting venture capital in Egypt. I mentioned also the work by, by Ms. Mida uh, and the World Bank, but we need much more. If you think about it, Egyptian, and just like I mentioned in my, my previous uh, point, that Egyptian startups of 2021, which was like the height of the funding uh, that Egyptian startups secured was $600 million. And actually, um, if you look at the available capital locally in Egypt that year that was deployed by Egyptian VCs, it was just 10% of that. It was just $60 million that actually local VCs invested that year. That means that Egyptian startups went and secured more than $500 million uh, from other sources, from the Gulf, from Saudi, from Africa, and they brought in this capital to Egypt. So we need to really increase the the depth of the capital availability in Egypt, especially locally. Uh, would like to see more financial institutions and entities investing in Egyptian startups. Uh, there were a few initiatives by the central bank that started a, a venture capital fund uh, called Include to focus on investing in Egyptian fintech startups. Also, there is Avans, which is a fund of funds and direct uh, fund uh, that is also uh, founded by commercial banks in Egypt, funded by commercial banks to invest in Egyptian startups. But we need ma many more than these two. Um, and I'm hoping this will be the track that we uh, will follow as like maybe at the Egyptian government level, but also at the private sector. Thank you, Ramos. Just one last question for you, Todd. 
you know, giving the, uh, the expectation for the, the coming uh, market cycle from the central banks around the world for decreasing the interest rate, I think that will benefit the emerging markets and typically Egypt. So where can you see the opportunities in which, in which industries and sectors? Yeah, certainly. I, so I, I, there's a couple of aspects that hit with the market cycle and interest rates. The one right now is that uh, we're seeing rates drop everywhere, right? And um, Egypt, our forecast is for rates to go down maybe 600 basis points this year, but it'll be towards the end of the year. And what that means is that we're starting to see more of that hot money flow in. Uh, and in fact, some of that hot money now is looking at three year, right? They're looking to hedge their returns. So, so we're seeing them take the risks uh, the, the opportunity I see, as we've talked about, I, I think um, the opportunity in tech is very high because you've got the, the domestic population is so good at it, right? And there's such a, an infrastructure. And you are, I think you're absolutely right that it, it enhances many other companies and industries, not just the, the tech industry. And I know for us, uh, we work with a few fintechs on extending our services on supply chain financing. Mm -hmm. the, um, the other industries I think that are growing in Egypt, I think the, um, the ESG-based industries, I think the one thing that COP27 did was really drove the government's awareness of the market opportunities in that space. So if you look at the, the number of hydrogen projects currently under review, uh, because Egypt is sitting, sitting in the best location, right? They've got a lot of land, they've got a lot of sun, a lot of wind, and they've got the Suez. Uh, so they can set up hydrogen operations there. The intent, too, is to basically get a significant amount of your domestic consumption uh, through um, renewable resources so that you can export the oil and gas to Europe uh, and drive the foreign currency. So I think there's opportunities in that space. Manufacturing, I think that uh, any manufacturing for export has, has possibility, uh, but certainly the exporting to um, Africa and Europe uh, and we see pharmaceuticals uh, and a lot of interest in pharmaceuticals right now. Uh, agriculture and ag tech also very, very hot at this point. And then primary manufacturing, uh, right? We do see um, a real desire to have um, auto and EV uh, as one, appliances, uh, any value add. So it, it really is about using Egypt as a manufacturing export hub. Thank you very much. I think this is all for our, for our panelists. Uh, is there any, I'll leave the floor for any questions. The floor. Any questions? Yeah, how are you? Um, thanks everyone. It's super insightful as a prospective business that's looking to enter into the Egyptian market. Um, definitely saw it on the opportunity. I'm just wondering if there's any um, advice on you know, a, a business that's operating successfully in Africa or another country. What are perhaps would like to take that? Uh, I, know, I know what my advice is, but these guys might give different advice, so I'm worried. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I think it helps to have a local partner, right? Especially because uh, you're in the, the tech business, right? And to, to be able to navigate um, the regulator uh, and, get, and get a local client, right? But to have that local partner that can help you, I think. I think I was going to say something similar. Actually, Good. But that's, I'm relieved but after, I, I, <laughs> and after I couldn't open the water for you. I, I feel like very vulnerable. But that I think applies to most African nations, right? Like whenever we're looking at a country that we'd like to expand in, your first thing is to look for partners who you could, who have existing operations on the ground, who understand the cultural nuances, who understand the regulatory framework that they're operating within, and then partner with them through that. Um, I think. What we've done, uh, what there has been a lot of improvement in is clarity. I think, uh, I think we all mentioned that. Um, so it's become a lot more clear what the framework is that you're operating within. Um, uh, so I think that, has, that transparency has helped things move a lot smoother. Um, like Todd said, there's a lot of reduction in bureaucracy and red tape to try to enhance the ease of doing business and the business climate in general. Um, so I think you should have a good time of it and feel free to reach out if you need uh, any more advice or help. I think Romes has something Just one piece to of say. advice, get good lawyers. <laughs> Just make sure that you have yeah, good legal counsel. Well, there's one at the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, yeah just <laughs> yeah. Pick good. Yeah, actually, it's a good point. I think yeah. because the startups usually like when you go to new markets, you try to go like the most efficient way. <laughs> no, but this is one thing you need to dedicate proper budgets yeah. for. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, well, and because they they will help you navigate yes, bureaucracy 100%. as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's unique, yeah, yeah. of course. Any more questions? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I work for Transport. Um, <coughs> I'm glad. I think one thing we all agreed on, and you mentioned this, is the hard currency situation. Right? Um, and I'm glad you mentioned Robin Eggman. I'm 36 years old, and I've seen, you know, anyone who's, who's lived the same experience has seen the Egyptian pound at three Egyptian pounds to a dollar, and then we've, we've, we've seen it at five, eight, and we all were holding on to it, right? question is, what are the precautions that the government are doing in order to make sure that this Russell Hegman deal is not just a short and medium term solution, but, but it's something that won't happen in the future. So are we working on our current account? This, like, how, how is it actually, is there any guarantees that we don't see this in the next three to five years? Um, as, as you mentioned, it also affects the startup situation, right? Directly yes, all the time, yeah. Yeah, I need someone from the Egyptian government to be here to answer this question. Yeah, <laughs> the problem is that we don't have any government officials yeah. to uh, to answer that question. Get some insights from from people. Yeah. No, I think again, just from an investor perspective, I think it's a positive outlook in general. Especially, I think Ras Hakma being one of the most positive things that happened in Egypt last year. Um, so yes, I think from our perspective, we would like to see more of this. Would like to see this through as well like being implemented and, and actually developed and delivered. Um, but def it definitely gives a lot of confidence as well to like the investor like community and ecosystem when it comes to looking at Egypt for a potential investment or expansion. Yeah, and maybe uh, as, well. as mentioned, it needs a government official to answer this. However, from our side, from the practical side, uh, those investors are educated and sophisticated investors. If they were not confident and if they didn't do their proper mm -hmm. due diligence on such transaction, yeah. they wouldn't deploy a, a massive amount of money in such. Yeah. So of course you, you should trust this. Yeah, and Mohammed, there's a few markers you can watch for, right? So we should be able to see if the IMF um, is happy with the fiscal spending, right? We're already seeing signs that the Minister of Finance is choking some of the, the government um, ministries, right? So we're, we're seeing them suddenly struggling with budget and, and um, EGP availability, not foreign currency availability. So they're, they're choking a little bit. So they're having to cut back their budgets. So that's a bit of pain, but it's an encouraging sign for longer term development. The other is to watch for the non-oil exports, right? That should go up and we should see it transition up because that's a marker that we are, we are export, we are, we're changing, right? We're becoming an export country. Uh, that one's probably three to five years, right? It reminds me when I was in first in China and they were having to really open up their market uh, and and really become an exporting country, right? But that was that that took them 20 years. Uh, so it, there'll be some paces in that. The other is with Russell Hekma, the 35 billion is for the property. There are, there are multiples of that that need to be invested over the next 30 years, and it's a 30-year project, so in many ways. And you just saw some announcements of the entities that are working in it. You know, Arascom is going to be actively involved. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, that there's gonna be a brand new airport. There's gonna be a brand new cruise terminal. That, that, that will bring in opportunity as well. So, so that's got a multiplier effect. Uh, I'm encouraged but we've probably got a year and a half to two years to see is the structural change to how the government operates um, in place, right? Do we have the fiscal um, mm -hmm. kind of um, maturity to be able to, to really have foreign currency availability and a pound that really floats? So, so why, it's too early to say we've solved it. Russell Heckman made it <laughs> much, much easier, but we probably have a year and a half to two years. Yeah, for the multiplier effect, they announced that there's going to be another injection of 120 billion USD dollars for the next three years for that project. Yeah. So I think the sustainability of the of the foreign flow, I think, will stabilize the markets and make the confidence of the of the investors. Mm -hmm. So I, one more question. Just one point, Mohammed. We were discussing earlier on, on, on Russell Tech. We, our firm, uh, 
best enough to afford to represent the way you want it. And, and aside from the cash and the cash infusion, I mean, my area is promising is that it's really, uh, Egypt has always had an issue in, in, uh, in a public private partnership model. Uh, so people keep them really difficult. I think with Russell Tech, we're seeing for the first time the real promise of uh, real profit sharing and real mm -hmm. partnership between mm -hmm. public and private, even though at the end they're two sovereigns. But as Seth says, I mean, the amount of private companies that will be involved is yeah. huge. Yeah. But I think that's that's where the city and, and then the value for that yeah. more than the 30 billion to 100 billion will come. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to point out to Mohammed's an alumni of HSBC Egypt, so, <laughs> so graduated many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? I think we are about time, so we don't want to hear the the ring of the bell. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for the our esteemed panelists, thank and thank you thank very you. much all thank you. for being with us. Thank you, thank you very much.